This is Ms. Wiles, and in this video, we'll be talking about angles formed by transversals. A transversal is a line that intersects two or more lines that are in the same plane. The angles that are formed by those lines and the transversal are given special names that are based on the relationship with, that they have with each other. The first term that we'll look at is corresponding angles. Corresponding angles are two angles that um, occupy corresponding positions. They have the same position within the, um, within the diagram that you're looking at. So in this example, angles 1 and angle 5 are corresponding, position, or corresponding angles just based on their position. Based on their position, they are corresponding. So as you're looking at this particular diagram, if you were to look at angle 4, it would correspond to angle 8 based on its position. Now, any other kind of relationship is not apparent in this diagram because these lines do not appear, L1 and L2, do not appear to be parallel. So any other relationship is not there, but to call them something to recognize their relationship, they are corresponding because of their position. In the second diagram that you see here, two angles are called alternate exterior angles if they lie outside the two lines but on opposite sides of the transversal. Again, that's called alternate exterior angles. Exterior meaning they're on the outside of the um, uh, transversal and alternate to show that one would be on the left and the other would be on the right. They are not corresponding because they're not in the same position. They are called alternate exterior angles. So in this one, angle 1 and angle 8 are alternate exterior angles. Also because they are on the outside of the two lines. The ones, angles that would never be considered for this definition are 3, 4, 5, and 6 because they are in the interior of those two lines. So in the second diagram, the second set of alternate exterior angles are angle 2 and angle 7. Two angles are called alternate interior angles. Similarly, they are on alternate sides or opposite sides of the transversal, but they will be inside, meaning the interior. They will be in the interior of the two lines, but on alternate sides of the transversal. So in this diagram, angles 3 and 6 are alternate interior angles, and angle 5 and 4 are alternate interior angles, just based on their position. We don't know anything about their angle measurements because that comes around whenever you have two parallel lines that are cut by a, that are intersected by a transversal or cut by a transversal, transversal you might hear it said. Two angles are consecutive interior angles. Consecutive meaning one right after the other, one after another, consecutive like the numbers one, two, three, consecutive like um, eight, nine, ten, because there's nothing in between. There's no space in between. They are right next to each other, one after the other. And interior, meaning they're inside the two lines, so the two that we see here in red, the three and the five, are consecutive interior angles. And the other two that could be considered for this definition are the four and the six. And I think there might have been something that I pasted here. Consecutive interior angles are sometimes called same side 
interior angle. It's just something that you might see. So in identifying angle relationships, let's pause the video here. If you're at home watching, um, go ahead and sketch this diagram onto some notebook paper so that you can come back after you have listed all the pairs of angles that you feel fit these descriptions and I will reveal the answer. And here we go. Pairs of corresponding angles. There are quite a few of them. One and five are corresponding based on their position. They are in the same position. Two and six are corresponding because of their position. It's just based on their position in relation to the two lines and the transversal. Three and seven are corresponding based on their position. And four corresponds to eight. Then looking at alternate exterior, there are some of these angles that would never even be considered because they're not exterior. Exterior means that they can't be interior, and interior is inside the two lines. So those would not be considered at all. And then you say, okay, they have to be alternate. So two and seven are alternate exterior, and eight and one are alternate exterior. Then we have our alternate interior. Again, interior, just like the inside of your house, an interior designer, we're going to be working with these angles that are inside the two lines. And alternate would be three and six, and then the other pair is four and five. And then finally, consecutive interior, Three and five, and then four and six. And that's just recognizing the relationship, recognizing what those terms mean and that particular relationship. So when those two lines, when those two lines are actually parallel lines, then there is a a better relationship or a tighter, closer relationship between those corresponding angles. Um, those corresponding angles are congruent. That means that corresponding angles are exactly congruent. Uh, they have the same measure. So if angle one was 75 degrees, that means that angle two would also be 75 degrees. Now, this is called a particular word that you may not be um, accustomed to, postulate. A postulate is a fact in geometry that is not proven, it is accepted as truth. And you should be able to, when you look at this, your eye tells you that these look like they are the same. That only occurs if those lines are exactly parallel. And if you think about how, line, uh, how angles are measured, if you were to use this as the originating side, what I'm doing here in blue, if you use that side of the angle, that ray of the angle as the originating side, and then what I'm drawing here, this ray is the terminating side, and you were to measure that with a um, protractor, you could see that they will both be exactly the same. <clears throat> so corresponding angles are congruent. That is a property that you need to know. All of these properties that we go over, you need to know them kind of combined together. Because as you probably remember, anytime you see this kind of relationship with all of these angles and lines and transversals, when you see this, there are lots of numbers there. So you have to be very careful about what you're looking at and pay attention to the positioning of the angles. Theorems are different from 
uh, postulates because um, they would have to go through a proof process based on some other facts that we know about angles and lines and things like that. But for your purposes, you need to understand the relationship. When you have alternate interior angles, you look at these two, the three and the four, they are also congruent. They may be in different positions, but the degree of the angle is the same. So alternate interior angles are congruent. Consecutive interior angles, those consecutive ones, the ones that we don't have consecutive exterior angles, consecutive interior angles goes back to supplementary, 180 degrees. Two alternate interior angles are, if you add them together, you'll get 180 degrees. Now, however you get to that conclusion is fine. Um, for example, if I look at the first diagram that I have here, as long as I remember that those alternate interior angles are exactly the same. Well, if angle 3 is 70 degrees, then angle 2, if we put that here, angle 2 would have to be 110 degrees because this is a straight line. And when we have two angles that form that straight line, they're that linear pair where that angle is going to be 100. And, those two angles together are going to be 180. Then if this one is 70 and this one is 110, then 4 is 70, and then we could put a 5 over here, and 5 would be 110. Sometimes it helps to kind of go through and work those kinds of things out as you're looking at a diagram. <laughs> Alternate exterior angles. <clears throat> Alternate exterior angles are congruent. Now, if you focus in on those two angles, they look like they're both larger than, the degree measure is greater than 90 degrees. So knowing that there has to be some kind of relationship, if we say that angle 7 is 125, then angle 8 would also be 125. And we could fill in all of the angle measures here based on that, based on any kind of relationship. If we know that angle 7 is 125, then this one's 55. And if this one, that I just called this one, if this one is 55, it forms a straight line heading down this way. And this one has to be 125. And then this one has to be 55. And then we have all of our relationships showing all together. We have straight lines that if we add those two angles, it'll be 180. We have vertical lines that if they're or vertical angles, that if they're vertical from each other, if they're directly across from each other, they're exactly the same. And then we'll have that same relationship, those same measures, as long as line one is parallel to line two. And that is not an equal sign. That is a line one parallel to line two. There is another theorem called the perpendicular transversal, which isn't very much different from any of the other relationships, but it's just special because the line is perpendicular to the two parallel lines. And so when uh, two parallel lines are cut by a perpendicular uh, transversal line, then you have 90 degree angles that are formed at each intersection. Looks a little bit like uh, Law Road and Ramsey Street where they try to catch you going through the stoplight. There's cameras. And then I forget what the next road a little further down is. Maybe this is Ramsey and Tokay. 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 And then oh, Law and Ramsey. And this is that great big crazy red light camera. I don't like them. They've caught me before. 
But I do slow down now. If it's yellow, I just go ahead on and stop because it's not worth it. It's too much money. And then you have to go through that. That wasn't me. And they're like, yeah, it was. um, Although in, in modern geometry courses, whenever it's incorporated into the Math 2 and Math 3 class, you don't actually have to do proofs step by step. Um, but there will be, you may have to uh, determine a particular uh, postulate or theorem that would go into a, a particular blank. So I thought it was necessary or, or helpful to show you what a proof looks like. Theorems have to be proven, and there is a step-by-step -step method. There are different things you can do. There's a flow chart. There's a, um, an organized proof like this. Of what I'm going to show you here, to prove the alternate interior angles theorem. Anytime you have to do a proof, you are given a particular statement, or there is information that is given to you based on a diagram, based on some kind of sentence, based on something that there is information that is given. And then there's something that you're trying to prove. Now in this example, we are given that Line P is parallel to line Q. And we're trying to prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. These are the alternate interior angles. And to do that, we start off in a, in a formal proof. You always start off with what you're given. What statement are you given in this situation? And you're given the fact that P is parallel to Q. You make a statement, and then you have to have a reason or a justification for that statement. And the reason for that statement is that it's given. Then as you go towards your goal of proving that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, you can say that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. Because there is the corresponding angles postulate, that is something that does not have to be proven. It is accepted as fact. And so you say angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. And I can say this because of the corresponding angles postulate. After that, you're still trying to get to the fact that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. So then you can say that angle 3 is congruent to angle 2. And in our example, it says the vertical angles theorem. You could use that as a reason, or you could say vertical angles are congruent. You can make a statement that is accepted as fact within geometry itself, and it's a good enough reason. And if your reason is true, then you've got justification for that response, and you go on. Number four is that angle one is, a, is congruent to angle two. So it's a process. It's like from this I can tell, from, from number two I can tell number three is true. From number three combined with number two, I can tell that number four is true. If angle one is congruent to angle three and angle three is congruent to angle two, then angle one is congruent to angle two. And that's the transitive property um, there's always a transitive property of congruence. For example, if 5 is congruent to 3 plus 2, then 3 plus 2 is congruent to 4 plus 1. Because all of those things are congruent to each other. And then finally, because of that, um, well, that is the final answer, or that's the final statement. Once you can make the final statement that you were trying to prove from the very beginning, then you've completed the formal proof. And this is what a formal proof looks like. And that's all I have to say about that. And this is the instruction that you have on um, angles that are formed by transversals.